Welcome back, everyone. I'll ask those who are with us live here in the hall to please take your seats so that we can get started. And also, very warm greetings to our online audience as well. We are now beginning our first technical session of this year's scientific forum. And we're going to use the next couple of hours to highlight scientific and technological breakthroughs in the nuclear sector, ranging from innovative reactor designs to new construction methods. And we're going to be exploring how they can boost nuclear's role in the transition to clean energy, with a particular focus on developments that support long-term operation of existing reactors, a subject we heard uh, a few remarks uh, on in our previous session, and also how they can support use of nuclear in combination with fluctuating renewable sources. So in this session, all of our speakers will be participating virtually. We will see them, first of all, in pre-recorded presentations. And a bit later, they will join us live via WebEx to answer your questions, dear audience. And that goes for the audience uh, in this room, but also for our online audience. You can submit questions via the chat function of the IAEA conferences app. And if you are uh, with us as a speaker, I'm going to ask, uh, as a virtual speaker, I'm going to ask that you please mute your microphone when you are not immediately speaking so that we get a stronger broadband connection. If you do pose a question, it will be curated and uh, read out, uh, as it were, by our online moderator, Jeff. It's great to have you with us. Hi, Jeff. And um, please, so that Jeff can also let us know, there he is again uh, for everybody uh, bright, brightly lit, and um, please do let us know who you are and where you are joining us from so that Jeff can give us those facts as well. And one last point to streamline our proceedings, I will be grouping speakers for the Q&A in clusters. So you will uh, we'll, we'll take three or four presentations at a time, and then we'll go to that particular group for uh, answers to your questions. If you have joined us at previous fora, then our first uh, speaker in this session is a very familiar face. She's Director General of the World Nuclear Association. Just a couple of years ago, she made a very compelling argument at the scientific forum for making nuclear power a key part of the solution to the climate crisis, a, an issue that has become even more important since. So it is a pleasure to hand over to the co-founder and former president of Women in Nuclear, Ms. Agneta Riesing. Welcome, everybody. Very nice to see you all here. I'm going to talk about key innovations in nuclear energy systems and give you an overview, an overview of things about things that have happened recently, not about things very, very far into the future, and not about things that happened very long time ago, but recent development. My name is Agneta Riesing. I'm the Director General of the World Nuclear Association. If the world is to address climate change while meeting sustainable development ambitions, then we need reliable low carbon nuclear generation to start growing fast. At the same time, the amount of energy demand is expected to grow and the electricity demand will make up a major share of this as we increasingly electrify heating and transport. In this graph, you can see the expectation for nuclear energy in the middle of the road scenario of the IPPC 1.5 degree report. The middle of the road scenario is where we can go on with our lives and also the developing world can have similar types of lives. Nuclear energy needs to grow sixfold by 2050 and achieve 25% of electricity generation to keep the global temperature rise bearable. However, IEA and IAEA projections show that the projected growth of nuclear energy will not be sufficient to meet these needs. Innovation can help to overcome many of the challenges that nuclear energy is currently facing and which, hold, which is holding back its growth. 
Fortunately, there are recent signs that the speed of innovation in the nuclear sector is accelerating. This is occurring across the life cycle of nuclear power plant and across the wider fuel cycle. In many key countries and growth countries, where you have nuclear reactor projects are being delivered successfully to cost and schedule, a recent highlight is the construction of Tianwan 5 in less than five years. Innovation in design and construction practices are driven and are also driving down project costs, and project risks and schedules. Examples include digitalization of plant information. This can help improve project governance and reduce the indirect costs of a nuclear project. Learning by doing is critical to productivity gains. For example, in Hinkley Point C, installing one ton of steelwork on Unit 1, it took 25 hours. On Unit 2, it takes just 16 hours. Innovation continues to drive improvement in the performance of today's nuclear plants. Notable innovations include additive manufacturing of bespoke components, such as the one pictured here. This helps deal with problems of suppliers because many suppliers might have not doing these, these components anymore. Artificial intelligence is being explored for use in automating scheduling of tasks. This should reduce the time and the complexity of outages and load following alterations that can help plants provide extra flexibility to deal with high uh, intermittency by the renewables. Innovation is also, of course, key for creating the nuclear plants of tomorrow. These will not only provide electricity, but also a range of other energy applications, such as domestic heat, high temperature industrial process heat, hydrogen production and desalination. The demand for low carbon heat is huge. According to IEA, heat accounted for 50% of global final energy consumption in 2018. Special note are the SMR technologies and they are being pursued by many nations. We now have a demonstration plants operating and or about, about to start construction. Notable examples are the floating nuclear power plant, uh, Academic Lomonosov, which is supplying both heat and power to a remote Arctic community. The Chinese high temperature reactor, which should start operations within the next year or two. And the new scale reactor, has received US design certification approval in September this year. As more and more SMR designs mature, the role is expected to grow rapidly in the 2030s and 2040s. And here, World Nuclear Association have made a special report on all the reactor designs and how they work together in the future. Innovations in the fuel cycle are improving the competitiveness and the security of the fuel supply, as well as the performance of the reactors. And enhanced fuels improve the safety of nuclear operations and offer the potential for longer operating cycles, plant uprates, and cost savings. Closing the fuel cycle with fast reactors and MOX fuel dramatically increases the amount of energy available from fuel and decreases the amount of waste that needs to be disposed of. Of course, some of the more famous challenges in the nuclear revolve around the back end of the fuel cycle and the end of the plant's life cycle. Here too, we see some big and important changes happening. On decommissioning, a number of important topics addressed through international cooperation and exchange between various research programs. The IAEA has made a variety of valuable resources available on its nuclear website. Important recent examples of technical innovation in decommissioning include automation and robotics. Uh, on high level waste disposal, it is important to note that there are many verified disposal concepts. Uh, for example, national, uh, national repository programs. We already have sustainable solutions for nuclear waste. It is great to see new technology open and op uh, options will start to emerge. One of those is um, deep isolation. In January 2019, they placed a prototype waste canister 600 meters in a borehole and then retrieved it using technology adapted from natural gas industry. But beyond technology, there are of course many, clearly many exciting innovative technologies making their way into the nuclear sector. It is also important to remember that innovation is more than just technology. For the nuclear sector, innovation in market design, 
in financing, in regulation, and also in project delivery will be key to reducing costs of new build, unlocking the full potential of existing facilities and facilitating advanced reactors. International cooperation remains key to overcoming the barriers facing new technologies and increasing their spread and uptake. Uh, especially I'd like to note that uh, Clean Energy Ministerial Nice Future Initiative, uh, one, one event took place just last weekend, and they highlighted at that event the flexibility benefits of nuclear energy, and therefore the important role it must play with renewables in a future decarbonized mix. I'm pleased to mention that the World Nuclear Association is supporting a number of these international initiatives. We are also working with other international organizations, such as United Nations Economic Commission for Europe, on the role of nuclear energy in achieving sustainable development and climate change goals. On the conclusions, nuclear innovation is driving improvement in all parts of the industry, enhancing reliability, efficiency, economics and flexibility. Nuclear is mature, reliable, affordable and need in innovative policy to fast track the deployment of large scale reactors to meet the increasing demand for clean electricity and to do this now. Innovation is accelerating the development and commer commercialization of SMRs, opening up additional applications for nuclear energy. The time to market will be key to the deployment of the innovative technologies. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take questions. And as I said, we will come back uh, to Agnette Riesing a little bit later uh, for a Q&A. Her remarks, by the way, on life cycle innovation will certainly set up our discussion on that topic tomorrow when we look at that very, very important issue in our third session of the forum. So we've heard some strong claims throughout the day so far regarding the benefits of nuclear power as part of a clean energy mix. But how can we weigh and assess those benefits in comparison to other sources? Our next speaker has developed a sophisticated system for assessing emissions. He's a researcher at the Laboratoire des Sciences du Climat et de l'Environnement near Paris. He was lead author of the Carbon Cycle chapter in the last IPCC climate assessment report. Here's the presentation by Philippe Sies. Good morning. My name is uh, Philippe Sies, and uh, I'm glad to present uh, how our recent work to monitor near real time CO2 emissions uh, can help to evaluate the effectiveness of clean energy innovation. We have to see that countries report their emissions uh, with a time lag of about two years after the emission happened for Annex 1 countries, more than five years for non-Annex 1 countries. This is insufficient for tracking uh, progress of uh, emission reductions in the context of the Paris Agreement. And this is clearly insufficient to understand how uh, large disturbances like the COVID-19 have affected our societies and the uh, production and consumption of energy. So what we have done here is that we have uh, collected and compiled a lot of uh, activity data, such as individual aircraft and ship tracks, gas delivery to different countries on an hourly to daily basis, hourly data on electricity production, transport and types, and mobility information from cell phone application, uh, GPS on cars and other data set. All this combined with uh, weather. And we have derived for six sectors, industry, electricity, uh, residential and commercial buildings, road, air and ship transportation, the first uh, models of daily CO2 emission India. Uh, when you look at the split between sectors, uh, you can see here that uh, the power sector had a strong decrease of emissions in February and then in the middle of March. The most affected uh, sectors have been the ground transportation, 
aviation, and to some extent, the industry. Uh, if you zoom on the power sector, you can see here the different uh, subsectors. We found that the global demand has decreased from by about 5% in the first half of the year. But interestingly, renewable supply has stayed uh, higher than normal. So what we are seeing is a downward adjustment of electricity supply from fossil fuel sources. Uh, the gas share has increased in the United States because of the low market price for this fuel. And regarding the nuclear, we see a small global net reduction, uh, in particular lower values in the US and the EU, but a coincident big increase with the confinement in China, India, and Japan. Uh, a more closer look at the power sector diurnal cycles. You can see here on the left the average monthly diurnal cycles for each source of electricity. We see that the warm winter condition in addition to the COVID and before the COVID has reduced the electricity demand. Uh, in the US, we do see a very strong increase of gas and a massive decrease of coal for price reasons, as well as a decrease of nuclear. And in Europe, a decrease of all the fossil fuel and a decrease of nuclear. You can see on the top left plot that the shape of the dyno cycle has changed before and after the confinement with a shift of the peak of consumption between the morning and the afternoon, which is also a challenge for renewable energy supply. In the next uh, release of our product, we are looking now at data at facility level using uh, thermic infrared plumes from uh, satellites like Sentinel-2. You can see here that before the confinement for the steel factory in France, there were several blast furnaces active, and except one, they all shut down during the confinement. So this gives us information about industry and uh, power sectors uh, activity at the level of individual plants. And to conclude, uh, I would like to reflect with you on how the kind of scientific study of sector-specific CO2 emissions per country can be used to really better evaluate the effectiveness of clean energy transition and investment. First of all, I believe it's important to have a disclosure of how emissions are fastly changes in each country and regions, uh, which is not the case as of today. Suddenly, uh, this data really allow us to understand why low carbon electricity sources can take over fossil sources under specific demand conditions and also under specific weather conditions. Specialized data help to prioritize the kind of most cost-effective reduction of emission hotspots, low-hanging foods for mitigation, and as the data will continue, it also allows to monitor structural changes that are expected in the near term from low carbon policies uh, and economic stimulus packages, which are related uh, to the uh, impact of uh, you know, transitions in lower carbon intensity, also improved technologies leading to different emission factors. Uh, because CO2 is co-emitted with uh, carbon monoxide and NOx, which are important atmospheric pollutants, it also helps to assess what are the co-benefits or the trade-off of reducing CO2 emissions for improving atmospheric pollution and air quality. And last but not least, uh, fine granulometry data uh, were also allowed to monitor city-scale transitions with new urban infrastructures and uh, city uh, climate action plans. With that, I would like to thank you very much. And again, we will come back to Philippe Sies uh, shortly. We hear next from the chief designer of a Chinese large advanced pressurized water reactor that has won international praise for its innovative approach to cost, efficiency, and safety management. He is a prominent pioneer in China's nuclear industry and also serves as a member of the standing group on nuclear energy that advises Director General Grossi here at the IAEA. It's a pleasure to hand over now to the video presentation by Ming Guang Zing. Ladies and gentlemen, hi from China. This is Dr. Zeng Ming Guang from State Power Investment Corporation of China. I do appreciate the agency to invite me to make a presentation on nuclear power is right way to meet both for climate and sustainable development. As you know, there is a great change in Tindri Tindri this year. 
the crosswise happened. The electric power generation reduced, but the stable and reliable supply became a challenge. So energy provision actually at any time is important to cool down the social crisis. It's very important to support the sustainable development. And one way, the artificial intelligence just to improve the efficiency of power generation, transmission, and the utilization, while itself consuming a lot of the energy. So I do believe that developed artificial intelligence will become heavy energy consuming industry, just like the heavy industry of the steel complex before. In the year 2019, the total global power generation in the world is about 27,000 terawatt hour, while China spend about 7,000, 27%. In China, the nuclear installed capacity is about 50 gigawatt, 2.4% of the power installation capacity of total grid. The power generation is about 4.6. And in order to achieve the goal of the temperature rise less than 2 centigrade according to the Paris Agreement, the global nuclear power target from World Nuclear Association is up to 25% power supply for main industrial road by 2050. I just say main industrial road, not the rural road. The solar winds expansion could be good for the general power supply, especially for the remote area, but won't resolve the reliable, stable, heavy industry base road operation in the road center. So I believe China grid power capacity would be from 2,000 gigawatt now to up to the 3,500 gigawatt before 2,050. So nuclear power generation from now China 4.6% would be right soon up to the world average 10%. I do believe in the future, especially around 2050, the Chinese nuclear power could be expansion to the 15 up to the 25 according to the real situation of the competitiveness of the nuclear power itself. The problems to be resolved in the nuclear power industry, as you know, quite many people against the nuclear power development due to the spent fuel, red waste, impacts from risk of accidents, how to resolve the spent fuel? I do believe that the process with the new technology should be used for such a spent fuel turning to the new resources. To minimize the red waste is the design requirements for the new plant. And to reduce the risk of the impacts from the accidents, also very important for the new safeguards new design of the nuclear power plants with the more intrinsic safety features. In the future, we think that from nuclear power industry, the design purpose, all the consequences from the any events of accidents should keep inside of nuclear power plant. You shouldn't have any impacts from any events and accidents to society. On the other hand, the economy is more important to have the good competitiveness with the affordable prices of electricity and the nuclear energy, especially high safety, high reliability, high stability, clean economic, low carbon emission, high efficiency. Here I just present several options from big to the small. The big is good for the electricity generations. Now with the new technology like the passive technology, AP1000, CAP1400, the core meltdown frequency could up to the 10 minus 6, and the love could up to the 10 minus 7, and the electricity in China we can reach about 6 cents per kilowatt hour. 
and the small one, just the land star one, could be used for heating purposes in the rural area, in the remote area. But some combined you know, purpose or applications, like the land star five, could be for the small power grid and also for the heating purposes with the electricity less than eight cents per kilowatt hour and the heating about six US dollars per gigajoule. The possible solutions for different purposes, like in the small districts in the urban rural with a smart micro energy grid, such a grid could be supported by the solar winds storage and a small nuclear power plant. The heavy industry center, especially in the future for the 5G for the data load center or big data center with the macro grid with artificial intelligence management, like hydraulic nuclear with a big unit, storage, fossil, and also solar wind. Most important for the solar and the wind, they needed the capability of the grid, the load follow as the solar wind energy supply is the intermittent. China is a big country. So we have the multi purpose, the power supply from nuclear power plant. The north could be used the heating reactors. The south, especially along with the coast, use the bigger unit to have the power supply. And the other areas, according to the utilization or the applications, can select the different types of the reactors. But the nuclear power, I do believe the future is promising. Thank you. Thank you very much for that presentation. So we will now come to our Q&A session. And I would like to begin, uh, first of all, by hopefully getting all of our speakers back uh, with us in a group so that we can field questions to them. And here they come, I believe. And I'm going to try to take questions from this room first. So if you have a question in this room, I'm going to ask you to give me a sign, raise your hand. And also, you will then use the microphone at your desk, please, so that our speakers can hear you. And after that, I'll go to questions online if we are getting some. And Jeff is kind of nodding his head, but, but also giving me a sign that perhaps we'll wait a bit. So if you're in our online audience and you want to ask a question, we'd really like to hear it. Please use the chat function on the IAEA conferences app. And Jeff is all ready to field those questions and pass them on to me. So I have a few questions of my own, but I don't want to use them until we first see if we have live questions in the room. Who has a question for one of our speakers? Any, any one of them? Okay, go ahead. Please let me make sure. Ismini, do we have the speakers with us? I'm not seeing them yet in the... Yes, we do. Okay, so please go ahead, uh, honorable uh, speaker uh, from Switzerland. <clears throat> Werner Burkhardt, a uh, question to the last speaker. What's the smallest SMR he has in his portfolio? He was not very specific on the size of these small reactors. So that would be a question... <coughs> That would be a question actually for Mingguang uh, Zheng. Are you with us? Uh, yeah, uh, yes. Actually, we, we, we developed develop several models, models to fit the, the different applications. applications. For, for example, example, for the heating, uh, for the time being in the China, uh, in the inland, uh, nuclear power plant is not permitted right now, but the future, I think, it could be. So for the future, uh, the, the compact nuclear power plant could be used, but for the time being, only can use the, the heating reactor. And the heating reactor weight just depends on the, depend on the, you know, the city scale. For example, some middle city, they need about two or four units uh, of 200 megawatt for the heating. Uh, that just to replace about uh, 25 to the 50 percent of the heating supply. But uh, only by the heating purpose, uh, the cost of the prices is quite high for the time being. But in the future, we think with the uh, scale, with the uh, up effects, uh, the price could be reduced. I'm, I'm just looking over at our technical staff to find out if we can actually see uh, Mr. Cheng. I guess I'm 
hearing that we can't see Mr. Cheng. Okay. Ah, okay. Um, if you are able to put your camera on, Mr. Cheng, then we could also see you as well as hear you. But, ah, okay. Looks like you're with us Hello. now. Hello. Yes, that's great. Okay, nice we, we unfortunately didn't see you for that answer, but I think we heard it well enough. So hopefully that did answer the question. Uh, good, very good. Who else has a question for any one of the three speakers? Anyone in the room? Okay, I'm not seeing any hands going up yet. Jeff, anything over there? Okay. Then I will, I will pose a couple of questions of my own, and if you decide you do have a question here in the room, give me a sign, same to Jeff. So let me start out with a question uh, to Anjeta Riesing, and it's great to see you again, uh, Anjeta. Um, I'd like to ask you, of those various innovations that you talked about uh, just now in your remarks, which ones do you see as the absolute most crucial if we want and must boost the share of nuclear in the overall energy mix. You said it's imperative to do that if we want to get to our climate goals. So what do you see as the most crucial innovations there? Um, that's a very tricky question, Melinda, because what I tried to say in my presentation... Oh, sorry. Um, oh, I'm not muted. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, no. I would say that we need all. The target for climate change is so tough that we need all types of energy sources that are low carbon, as well as all types of innovations. But I would say if we are going to do something fast, and that is what we really have to do, we have to now start to act. We have to, in fact, go with the law of reactors that we know how to build and repeat and repeat what we already can do. I think it's, the task is enormous absolutely enormous and the time scale is not that long but over time we will see many of these smrs coming in and heating is extremely important because heating have emissions that are quite large from the whole energy sector so it's more or less half of the the emissions coming from heating um, so i think it's uh, very important to have those uh, those units also for industrial process heating I think these are absolutely key. More people in the world are dying from, from having no heat than those that are uh, dying for, because it's too, uh, too hot. Thank you very much. So if I can just uh, repeat that uh, one more time. It sounds like you're saying to us, yes, innovations are important, particularly when we look at the longer term. But if we want to start moving now, and we were reminded in our opening session about the long lead times, especially on mm -hmm. big infrastructure projects, that if we want to start moving now, we really need to be going with what we have and simply uh, scaling it up. That's very... Is my sound bad? Don't hear me. You're, there's a little bit of dropout, but we can hear you. Okay, okay. Thank you, Melinda. I think you made a very good summary of that. Good. Thank you very much, uh, Anjeta. And maybe we'll come back to you in, in just a moment. A question for Philippe uh, Sies, uh, if you are, uh, yes, uh, very good to see you. So your emission studies, uh, you described a, a number of the issues that you are going to be able to get more concrete data on, but can they help you to identify the optimal energy mix for meeting climate goals? Uh, no, definitely not. The, if you want to look at the long-term scenarios, uh, of course you have to play uh, on the demand side and uh, you have to have policy on the supply side to have the right sources of energy, mainly low carbon energy like nuclear, renewable or hydro. What our data can help us to do is to understand the underappreciated effect of weather and climate change on the uh, energy supply and the energy demand. When you have more heat wave in summer, it calls for more electricity during the hot months. And when you have milder winter, like the winter of 2020 was about five degrees warmer than average in regions like Russia, you also have to adjust the energy supply. Our data can help us to understand the interactions between uh, 
climate change and emissions, and those interactions have been perhaps underappreciated when building scenarios of mitigation. There is also a feedback of climate change on the energy production system and therefore on CO2 emissions. Apropos underappreciation, uh, as uh, Mingguang uh, Zheng just reminded us, nuclear power itself is uh, in many places somewhat underappreciated. The public remains wary in many places uh, of nuclear power plants. Can the insights from your studies perhaps also improve communication and understanding among publics and governments when it comes to the cost-benefit balance on nuclear? Yes, I think it does help to disclose and to understand the role that nuclear power plays in the energy supply, uh, in particular when you have a peak of demand. Uh, of course, uh, having uh, uh, new and accurate data to monitor how the energy mix is fastly changing across countries and the globe, uh, it's a useful tool for you know, public information, policy design, but in the end, of course, the decision of building cleaner energy systems belongs to policymakers and governments. Thank you very much. Uh, and then uh, also a question for Mingguang Cheng, and I hope I'm more or less saying your name correctly. Um, we just heard Agneta Riesing say, say, we need to go with what we have, the technologies that we know, innovation is important, but we also simply need to be scaling up. So China, in fact, is doing just that. You are building more nuclear power plants than any other country. What can other countries learn from China's experience, also that might help them overcome challenges with trying to scale up and build uh, more? First, uh, we would like to say, use the proven technology, use the proven mode of the cooperation between the, you know, among the contractors, and uh, also the proven, you know, uh, equipment. That's very important uh, to reduce the, 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 the risk uh, in the implementation. And the second, uh, we should uh, tell the publics uh, that now the safety of the nuclear power plant is much better than before. All the nuclear power plant happened with the same accident. Actually, they are quite uh, old the philosophy of the uh, safety and the technology. So now actually the new design requirements, new design basis are much, you know, serious and much severe to compare with the before. We think the safety, especially intrinsic safety, uh, is guaranteed. And the second, uh, we should say that the prices resulting from the construction, resulting from the equipment supply, resulting from the operation, especially by the spell parts, should be reduced. So the prices of the energy and the nuclear power could it be affordable by the publics? And the third, very important, you should have the clear, you know, uh, understanding or clear, you know, demonstration that any events and accident from the plant couldn't impact to the society, not beyond the, the, the site of your plant. So you should enhance your internal safety furthermore, and also to reduce the impacts of the red waste and also impacts of the some accident risk. So we think that the nuclear power yourself, you should try best to demonstrate you are becoming better, your technology, your prices, and your demonstration. And the second, the publics should we have the proper communications with them. If you don't you know, let them go into with you. They don't know. So they couldn't accept. Anyhow, in the society, they always, you know, took positions once against the ones favorable to the nuclear power plant. We try to get more people for the favorable nuclear power plant development. And we do believe that the future nuclear is a promise, it's necessary. 
Thank you very much. So some synergy there also with Philippe Sies' answer about uh, how to perhaps uh, improve, enhance public acceptance. I have a question over here, if you would please, uh, and tell us, if you don't mind, who you are, where you're from, and to whom your question is addressed. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Amir Manzoor, and I'm from the Permanent Mission of Pakistan. Uh, first of all, uh, very big thanks to agency for arranging such a, a wonderful uh, scientific forum for us. Uh, my question is uh, for Dr. Cheng Ming Wang, and uh, it, it's a very simple question, what uh, the member states would like to listen. Uh, as uh, it was discussed that from large water reactors, now we are converting to small water reactors. Uh, we being a pro-nuclear uh, power state, we definitely have uh, uh, no objection in this. But uh, one thing that always comes in uh, the mind is regarding its economics. Uh, for the small water reactors. As Dr. Cheng, you just explained that maybe uh, there is certain market for the small modular reactors, as you explained uh, in your presentation. I was of the view that uh, you being a designer, what progress have you made in uh, ensuring that the cost is going down for the maybe the nth reactor, number one? Number two, and have you been, been uh, working on standardization of maybe some of the systems or some components, if not the whole reactors? Because we know in the world there are more than 50 or 70 designs. So the member states or any country embarking would be very interested in having some kind of standardization in the uh, models. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, okay. I'm going to go straight to Dr. Cheng, and then I'll come back to you in just a moment. Uh, go ahead, please, Dr. Cheng. Yeah, actually, uh, the competitiveness of the economy for the small module reactor uh, is very important. Firstly, uh, as I just mentioned, the technology itself uh, should be developed, should be proven. Secondly, you should have the complete supply of the equipment and the material system. If you don't have such a complete system, it's very difficult to get the competitive you know, uh, prices. So that's important to have the complete supply system of the equipment and the materials. And third, actually, you should try your best because the safety of the small reactor is higher than the bigger one. But uh, the requirements for the small one may be similar to the bigger one. There's no economy. So you should try to find out the new review or licensing requirements for the small reactors. For example, for the zones definitions, for the safety definitions, and for the, uh, the, 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 the operation the requirements. So with such a change in the lights of high safety, you try to get better economy. That's the, the efforts should be made by the nuclear power industry. And the third, very important, you should compete with some you know target for example you should compete with the the gas you know heating if your price is, is less than gas heating i think in the future you are promising if you your price is higher than all others then no future for you so you should try your best from the equipment supply from the proven technology from the good application and also from the operation management in the future so with the artificial intelligence, we think that the operation, uh, the, the, the people's load could be reduced. Also, the members to be used for the operation should also be reduced to make it a good economy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I had a question from Myanmar, and then I want to come to Jeff if there's online questions. And we'll bundle those, because we are now just about at the end of our time. Uh, hello, uh, good afternoon. My name is Joseph. I'm from Myanmar Mission. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, all speakers for their um, excellent presentation. Uh, uh, I, to, I, I want to direct my question to Dr. Seng, Chief Designer of Nuclear Industry from China. In his uh, video uh, presentation, I noted that uh, he talked about the uh, various, various uh, purposes, various purposes for possible solution for different purposes. So uh, he mentioned uh, mainly two things, uh, solar and uh, wind power and storage, and the other thing is uh, uh, heavy load for industry. So 
I wish to know, just for my clarification, uh, is uh, Dr. Sen suggesting that the solar and wind power is uh, mostly suitable for, I mean, light industry or nuclear power is, used, uh, is most suitable for heavy load industry, you know, just for clarification. Can you clarify, please? Thank you. Thank you. Then we'll get a really quick cl clarification from Dr. Zheng. You're still there, I hope. Your camera is currently off. Okay. No, it's good. There you are. He's okay. coming. Hello. Could you just yeah. briefly clarify? Did you hear the question? Yeah. Yes, uh, I hear the question. Uh, actually, you know, the solar and the winds uh, are not so good for the baseload operation. So if you use the solar and the winds in the future, we think it need to be supported by the nuclear, by the fossil power plant, or by the hydraulic to meet the stable power supply. And second, for the solar and the winds, I think in the future it's good for the hydrogen production for transportation energy supply. So uh, in the future, from the different applications, the nuclear could for the baseload operation, for the heavy industry, for the load heavy, you know, uh, center. So uh, the solar and the winds and other resources of energy could be used for the different purpose. That's just uh, build up the map for the energy supply in the future. Thank you very much. Jeff, what do you have for us? Uh, thanks, Melinda. We have a couple of questions that have come in through the app. Uh, they're related, of course, to what we've heard so far, but perhaps we'll go with this one. Um, I guess Agneta Rising might be the best for, for this. Uh, financial investments in renewables outstrip nuclear by a large margin. Nuclear is in decline in advanced economies, especially in deregulated energy sectors. Can you talk about the future for nuclear power without tackling its financial competitiv competitiveness? Great question. Thank you very much. We'll pass that straight on to Anita. Yes. I would like to say that there is a lack of financing in certain places and in certain circumstances. If we look to the cost of nuclear, that is uh, the levelized cost of electricity, as well as the system cost. Nuclear is the cheapest of all low carbon technologies, as well as it's the only low carbon technology that delivers baseload. And there is a lot to do on financing because these markets are failing. And we see also we are failing the climate change goal. There has to be innovation in markets in order to make nuclear moving forward, because we all need nuclear and we need it to grow sixfold if we're going to have a good future and reach 1.5 degrees. So a lot of innovation is needed in, in, the, in the deregulated markets to make it function so we get the world we want. And again, that is an issue that we will return to uh, tomorrow as well when we talk about barriers. Uh, so I think Jeff has one more question for us. Yeah, we have one more. Uh, it's about SMRs. Uh, the question is, can SMRs really deliver on the promise of clean and affordable energy before 2030, considering that countries are interested in them, but no one is actually at the moment buying this technology? And to whom uh, did, did they specify to whom that should go? It wasn't specified, no. Okay. Who would like to take a shot at that question? Uh, yeah, in China, actually, we tried to build the SMR in the near future. And uh, we think that with such a development for the multiple applications of MSR, MSR just the paved road for the future, SMR could be multiple applications for the power generation, for the heating purpose, process heat, even you can have the considerations. So if only one application, maybe economy not good, but with multiple applications, I do believe that SMR with the competitiveness of the economy. So they are so promising, they are so future. Thank you very much. Anyeta, did you want to add anything to that? I think it's very important here to say, yes, they are not on the market yet, but there are already some construction. So it takes time to build up the, the industry capability. And of course, nobody can right now easily buy a reactor that is just in the just now being licensed or just in demonstration. We need some experience. We need to move uh, forward. But I would think in the end of the 30s, they will have a significant contribution. 
Thank you very much, and that's not as far away as it uh, might seem. So let me just say thank you to all three of you for being with us here to talk about some of the big picture issues uh, when we look at innovation and technological advances. Many thanks to you. Let us now drill deeper on advances in the nuclear reactor design and construction. As was mentioned in our opening session and just now as well, cost considerations can be a very daunting challenge for countries looking to expand nuclear's share. Innovative reactor designs improve efficiency, reduce waste, and help maximize use of resources, making the economics significantly more attractive. So here to tell us more about new designs and technologies that hold the promise of boosting safety and efficiency is Yuri Komyakov. He is Chief Scientific Officer of Rosatom's Proryev project, which aims to create a new technological platform for advanced large reactors. And he appears in video presentation. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to make a presentation on advanced large reactors with enhanced safety and efficiency for climate goals. Energy production continues to play a dominant role in total greenhouse gas emissions. Energy development scenarios show significant deterioration of the situation and the current course of its development. Current improvements of the situation, meaning reduction of greenhouse gas emissions by three, four times, is possible with the transition to carbon-free technologies in the scenario of sustainable development. Nuclear power certainly belongs to this class of technologies. It is not only not inferior to renewable energy sources, but also has a number of advantages that allow achieving a synergetic effect from the joint implementation of various types of carbon-free technologies. However, a significant impact on decarbonization is possible only with the large-scale development of nuclear power, at least 25% instead of the 10% that it has in the world today. But this is possible only under the following conditions. First, qualitatively new level of security must be achieved, excluding the repetition of such events as Three Mile Island, Chernobyl, and Fukushima. Second, nuclear technologies should be economically competitive with both steam gas and renewable energy sources. This can be done most rationally by improving large power thermal reactors and introducing fast reactors. Modern designs of new generation reactors have significantly higher safety and significantly reduce the likelihood of severe accidents. The introduction of passive security systems should be noted as the main trend. Instead of relying on active components, the emphasis is on natural forces, gravity, natural circulation, compressed gases, selection of fire and explosion-proof materials, nuclear safe design of the core. For example, in the AP Thousand project, in the event of loss of electricity, passive systems automatically shut down the reactor and maintain it in a safe state for 72 hours without human intervention. In containment or in vessel devices for keeping the fuel manned, melt significantly reduced the release of radioactivity into the atmosphere, even in extremely unlikely severe accidents. In prospective studies, the use of accident-tolerant fuel and or the abandonment of the use of zirconium alloys are assumed, which makes it possible in principle to exclude the possibility of vapor zirconium reaction, leading to the formation of hydrogen and explosions, which took place in Fukushima. It is important that the improvement in safety is in accompanied by the simplification of the design of reactors and a decrease in the cost of building nuclear power plants. Fukushima accident hit hard on the image of boiling water reactors, but modern designs are capable of cooling the reactor in natural circulation mode without pumps. Toshiba's design shows an extremely low probability of core damage and that a single ESWBR would eliminate more than 7.5 million tons of greenhouse gas emissions per year under U.S. conditions. 
Further development of single-loop water reactors is envisaged in the fourth generation SCWR project. Measures to increase the efficiency up to 45%, minimizing thermal emissions into the atmosphere should be noted. Also, large-scale development of nuclear power is impossible without optimizing the consumption of natural uranium resources. They are trying to solve this problem in this project of thermal reactor by increasing the breeding of secondary fuel. However, the cardinal solution to the problem of fuel resources lies in the field of fast reactors and closed nuclear fuel cycle. The successful experience of operating large sodium-cooled fast reactors, BN600 and BN800, allows for the first time to approach the solution of the key problem of fast reactors, which hinders their implementation, ensuring their competitiveness in BN1200 project. Integral design eliminates the possibility of coolant loss and loss of core cooling, similar to what happened at Fukushima. Also, the design virtually eliminates the potential for sodium fires with radioactive sodium. However, to drastically exclude such a possibility, lead cooled reactors are proposed. They fully implement the principles of inherent safety, including the use of equilibrium core, which in principle excludes the possibility of an uncontrolled increase in power during reactivity accidents, boiling of the coolant, and a number of others. Inherent safety technologies incorporated in fast reactor projects exclude the need for evacuation and resettlement of the population in case of any accidents and exclude the repetition of situations similar to those in Fukushima or Chernobyl. I would like to note that in Russia it is proposed to further develop the concept of inherent safety by expanding it to the closed nuclear fuel cycle facilities. Projects are already being developed to create not only individual nuclear power plants, but also powerful industrial energy complexes, including closed nuclear fuel cycle facilities for implementation in 2035. Such power complexes provide technological basis for solving another major environmental problem, reducing the radioecological risks of radioactive waste from nuclear power to the level determined by natural uranium raw materials. Analysis of modern and prospective projects show that advanced nuclear power reactors are the solution for generating safe, secure, and responsible baseload electricity with no greenhouse gas emissions. Thank you for your attention. And we'll have uh, an opportunity a little bit later also to pose questions to Mr. Komyakov. Now let us zero in or drill a bit deeper on innovative modular reactor designs. Uh, as we heard uh, a moment ago, they can cut down both on construction times and on costs. We'll be hearing from Rita Baranwal. She serves as the Assistant Secretary for the Office of Nuclear Energy in the U.S. Department of Energy, leading its efforts to promote R&D on advanced nuclear energy systems. Here she is on video. Thank you, Director General Grossi, for the invitation to speak here today. I view nuclear energy as crucial to ensuring the sustainability of our environment now and into the future. For the United States, nuclear energy is the largest source of clean, reliable, and ele resilient electricity, generating about 20% of the electricity in the United States and over 55% of the nation's clean energy. In 2019, Electricity that was generated by nuclear in the United States avoided the release of over 476 million metric tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. That's like taking 100 million cars off of the road. Many countries see nuclear energy as a means to meeting their energy demand and growth, supporting their clean energy goals, and providing energy diversity and security, just like we do. I am confident that the U.S. nuclear energy technologies that we're developing can and will play a major role in providing the U.S. and the world with clean, reliable energy for decades to come. I believe the nuclear industry in is innovating now more than ever, especially in the advanced reactor technology space. Here in the United States, a diverse catalog of technology options are underway, from micro-reactors for small grids, remote or islanded communities, 
to SMRs, to large reactors to meet base load generation needs, we have the right reactor for the application. However, there are challenges associated with nuclear energy that cannot be dismissed. Primarily, it's high capital cost, build time, and limited options. While many countries are successfully building new nuclear plants and seeing costs decline, the U.S. has had a history of cost increases, what some might call a reverse learning curve. Many of these challenges surround a first-of-a-kind design and the decades-long atrophy in our ability to build nuclear reactors. The more we build and the more we exercise our domestic supply chain, the more likely we are to see our learning curve head in the right direction. The department is taking action to assure that there is a pipeline of new, advanced reactors that will help to reestablish needed U.S. capabilities in the nuclear industry. Our new Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program, or ARDP, is a key element in rejuvenating our domestic nuclear capabilities. This is a private-public cost-share arrangement that's designed to demonstrate two commercially competitive U.S.-based advanced reactor designs in the next five to seven years. The Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program also provides support for the development of designs that are not quite ready for commercial deployment, assuring that future generations of advanced reactor designs are available. The Advanced Reactor Demonstration Program is expected to result in new nuclear designs that will help to increase the demand for nuclear energy for a broad range of applications, including electrical power, high quality process heating, and integrated energy systems. As these designs are developed, we expect to see the fabrication and construction requirements of these designs drive improvements in the domestic supply chain as new manufacturing technologies are developed to meet the current and future demands for unique parts, components, and to do it better and at lower costs. Advances in manufacturing technologies, including additive manufacturing, New joining techniques, modular construction, and improved factory and field fabrication are all essential to the future of nuclear energy. The department is making significant investments in advanced manufacturing with the goal of reducing the construction time of new nuclear plants by six months or more and reducing the cost of components for nuclear plants by at least 20%. This includes the department's investments in the Transformational Challenge Reactor, or TCR, which will develop the technical basis to apply advanced manufacturing techniques and digital predictive analysis capabilities to deliver a new approach to nuclear design and qualification for advanced reactor technologies. The Transformational Challenge Reactor Program represents exactly the type of exciting, leading edge advanced manufacturing R&D that is needed to accelerate innovation and reduce costs for advanced reactor designs of the future. The department's programs are already demonstrating the application of advanced manufacturing to produce high performance and high quality components through the manufacturing of sample parts of innovative advanced reactor designs. These new applications include advances in hot isostatic pressing and joining techniques for large scale parts such as reactor vessels, which are being demonstrated on a two third scale new scale small modular reactor vessel design as well as demonstrating the manufacture of a salt pump impeller for Kairos Power's new advanced reactor prototype through additive manufacturing. Another program that will have an impact on the development of advanced nuclear technologies in the U.S. is the Versatile Test Reactor. The Versatile Test Reactor will provide a long-term source of fast spectrum neutrons to support accelerated development of fuels, materials, instruments, and sensors. A unique feature of the design and construction of the VTR will be the use of unified digital engineering design tools and integrated requirements management systems, effectively creating a digital twin that will greatly minimize the need for design changes during construction. Deploying all of these advanced technologies and revolutionizing the way that we think about nuclear energy is a lofty goal, but I am confident that working together we can address the design and construction challenges facing nuclear energy to meet a wide range of goals in a low carbon energy future. I look forward to a lively panel discussion. Thank you.
And we will have that lively panel discussion in just about uh, five, a uh, little more than five minutes from now after the final presentation in this cluster. And it explores how innovation in materials science from molten salt to liquid metals can also help drive sustainability. Our speaker is Hideki Kamide. He's chair of the policy group at the Generation Four International Forum, GIF, which promotes international collaboration on next generation nuclear technology. Guten Tag, konbanwa, and good morning, everyone. My talk here is molten salt reactors and other fast reactors for sustainability. For the sustainable use of nuclear, smaller burden for the environment is a key issue. As you know, because of the higher power density, nuclear has large advantage for the construction footprint and the volume of the fuel and also waste. But we need to take care of the disposal of high-level radioactive waste. The left-hand side figure shows the nuclear reaction in LWR cycle. Fission reaction is mainly done by uranium-235 which comes from only 0.7% of natural uranium. In parallel, uranium-238 captures the neutron and converts to plutonium-239 and further to plutonium-240 and 241, and then americium-241. The figure middle shows the time trend of radiotoxicity of the nuclear waste. As you can see, plutonium is a main contributor but minor actinides of americium and curium are important for long time range. That is why fuel cycle and reprocessing are significant, which separate plutonium and uranium and make reuse in the reactor. But minor actinides? Next theme is longer and stable use of energy. Renewable energy are the solar panel and wind farm have eternal energy from sun, but naturally they have daily and seasonality changes. The figure middle shows lifespans of natural resources. Uranium resource has also limitation around 140 years comparable with fossil fuels. In order to use nuclear for longer time, the use of plutonium coming from the most part of the natural uranium is significant. Safety is a first for the use of nuclear. This hatched region in the map shows the evacuation area of Tepco Fukushima Daiichi HF NPP accident. At this moment, 43,000 people live still apart from the home. We need to take care not only the accident but also significant influences on the society. This table shows goals of Generation 4 International Forum, GIF. Safety. Our goals of reactor development are very low likelihood and degree of reactor core damage, and to eliminate the need for off-site emergency response like HF. Here, you can see the several types of fast neutron reactors selected by GIF. The fast neutron can make fission of plutonium-240 and americium-241. These are difficult for thermal neutron in LWR. And also, larger number of neutrons in each fission contribute to conversion from uranium-238 to plutonium. The coolants in these reactors have relatively heavy nuclides and higher boiling temperature, sodium, lead, and molten salt fuel. That is why the neutron energy is high and also coolants have no phase change, including the helium gas cooled reactor, and it is good for safety. Let me start from molten salt reactor, which can be set into the nuclear fuel cycle. MSR can help incinerate long lived actinide, plutonium, and americium from LWR spent fuel. This big graph shows. Mossad reactor schematic by Rosatom. In the fuel cycle, MSR can use and burn TRU nuclides of plutonium and minor actinide. 
MSR uses liquid circulating fuel like a fluoride salt here. This view graph shows the fuel reprocessing in molten salt fast reactor MSFR by CNRS. The liquid fuel enables processing in situ during reactor operation. That means compact arrangement of reactor and fuel reprocessing unit is possible. Next is a sodium cooled fast reactor. SFR can be combined with LWR fuel cycle for plutonium management. Left side diagram shows a closed fuel cycle case study in Japan. Several capacity of SFR are used to cycle the degraded plutonium including plutonium-240 from the spent fuel of LWR, especially uranium-plutonium-mixed fuel MOX. The right-hand side figure shows the amount of spent fuel waiting for the fuel reprocessing. By using SFR, the spent fuel can be reduced especially for spent MOX fuel of LWR together with efficient use of plutonium. Here, you can see safety feature of decay heat removal in SFR that is common to liquid metal cooled reactor. This figure shows the schematic of the cooling system of SFR. It is easy to keep the coolant level by simple guard vessel red color line in the figure. Because of no high pressure inside to push out the sodium even in an accident. Then, Natural circulation of a coolant can work to remove the decay heat without any pump or external power. That is enhanced by a large height difference between the core and air cooler of the final heat sink. The decay heat can be removed by a simple system. Next is the safety of gas cooled fast reactor, which is high pressure system because of efficient cooling of helium gas. The decay heat removal system can use also natural saturation. In order to keep the coolant, a small guard vessel covers the primary system. The pressure in the guard vessel can be set higher in advance as a safety design option. That's all today's my talk. The details can be seen in GIF webinar for six reactor systems. Thank you very much for your attention. So we will now move on to a Q&A with uh, those three uh, members uh, of the panel, and I'll ask our technicians to get them back on screen. And meanwhile, I'll look around the room to see who might have a question for any of the three speakers we have just heard. Mr. Komyakov, Ms. Baranwal, and also Mr. Hideki. So, sorry, am I hearing someone over here? Okay, nobody in the room right now. Yes, go ahead. Thank you. Again, a question to the last speaker. You talked shortly about gas-cooled reactor, high-temperature reactors which would be fit to produce hydrogen. You have a reactor in Japan since decades, but there is not too much movement. Uh, what's the reason for it? Costs or uh, loss of helium? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Sorry. Today's Today my talk is uh, about the uh, uh, fast neutron reactor. So I speak about the gas cooled fast reactor, not the high temperature gas cooled reactor. But uh, uh, gas cooled reactor and the GFR can also use for the high temperature uh, uh, utilization. And uh, it also contributes to the hydrogen production, of course. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else for now in the room who has a question? Then I'll ask Jeff how it looks in terms of online questions. Thank you, Melinda. Yeah, we have a few that have come through. Uh, let's start on this one about fast reactors. I think it's for uh, Yuri Komiakov. The question is, how can capital costs be lowered for fast reactors? What other factors besides those, are, besides capital costs, are hindering their deployment? 
Even though Russia has been successful in developing the BN 800, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, that a customer has been found outside of Russia for this reactor. Why is that? Okay, uh, but uh, today I may speak on Russian and I ask my colleague to translate from Russian uh, to English. Okay, BN800 was a project of the 90s, of the last century. It was not supposed to be commercially uh, acceptable uh, or commercially uh, deployed. В России БН-800 был построен для одной цели. БН-800 был построен в России только для одной Для того, чтобы оперативно отработать технологию замкнутой ядерной топливной цели. To master the technology of uh, closed uh, nuclear fuel cycle. А экономическую конкурентоспособность предполагается достигнуть в проекте БН-1200. And uh, uh, the new project, BN1200, this project is supposed to be uh, commercially competitive, not the BN800. It is being developed now. And many of the systems uh, are being updated or upgraded, or they are new, and uh, therefore they will allow it to achieve competitiveness. And we hope to hope to achieve it in the next three years. Thank you very much, Jeff. More questions from the online audience? Uh, yes. Um... Let's see here. Um, there's also a question about um, uh, molten salt reactors, uh, perhaps for um, uh, the speaker from uh, Generation 4. Uh, what is a, a deployment time frame for SMRs? Uh, can it be, how can it be sped up? Can SMRs be financially competitive when nuclear power uh, is facing such uh, serious hurdles? Mm. Uh, in the Generation 4 International Forum, we have some roadmap of each uh, reactor systems, and uh, uh, molten salt reactor is a uh, kind of a very uh, innovative idea, and uh, there are some uh, difficulty also at this moment. There is some uh, mm, collusion uh, is a uh, we have to overcome. And, but uh, uh, in case of the small modular reactor development, uh, molten salt reactor and also the sodium cooled fast reactor or the lead cooled fast reactor are also uh, in, in our challenges. Now we are going to uh, build such a reactors at this moment. So uh, I have to say uh, we can go ahead uh, such a development in these uh, fast neutral reactor, including the molten salt reactor. Uh, you you said, said that also the financial issue. Uh, financial issue is uh, a little bit difficult to say from the Generation 4 International Forum, but uh, uh, as uh, uh, Ms. Le Ms. Leiter said about that, uh, such uh, uh, um, support from the government is also uh, very important for the development of such innovative reactors, I understand. Thank you. Thanks, and maybe I'll also ask Rita Barnwell to weigh in on challenges uh, involving, uh, challenges to adoption of advanced manufacturing techniques in the nuclear sector in general, and also perhaps what the Department of Energy is doing about those challenges. Sure, sure thank, thank you. you. Uh, can you hear me okay? Yes. 
Okay, great. So the Department of Energy is funding several research and development programs in the area of advanced manufacturing. Um, some of the examples include looking at the microstructural behavior of materials that have been laid down with additive manufacturing techniques, understanding the behavior out of irradiation, and then also if they're going to be put into irradiation atmospheres, understanding the behavior during and post irradiation. So those types of uh, research activities are extremely valuable um, and definitely will be leveraged to start using products and components made using these techniques in actual reactors in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Jeff, more questions uh, from the online audience? I think, I think that's, that's, that's about it for now. Okay, yeah. then just a couple more perhaps uh, from my side since we do have a few, or do we Sorry, have yeah. others in the room? Yes. yes, please, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Alexander Bichkov, uh, a representative of uh, State Corporation Rosatom. I have uh, a question, a remark to uh, Committee Sun. Uh, in uh, his first slide, uh, he demonstrated um, uh, uh, the resources of uranium. Of course, uh, it was. Uh, it is connected to uh, current nuclear power. Uh, maybe uh, he can highlight uh, um, how long uh, uh, period uh, uh, could be uh, uh, used for nuclear power uh, if we will uh, apply uh, closed fuel cycle, fast reactors, and uh, new type reactors. Thank you. Yes, yes thank you very much. much. The Fast neutral reactors can support the light water reactor on the point of the uh, kind of the disposal of the radioactive uh, waste, but also the contribute to the longer use of the uranium or longer use of the uh, uh, nuclear power uh, operation, as you said. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Other questions here in the room at the moment? Okay, don't see anything in the room. Um, perhaps just one other question from me, and that is in regard to uh, the private sector, and uh, uh, a question that I'll pose first of all to uh, Kamide San, but also to any other speaker who uh, cares to weigh in on this. Uh, uh, many of the companies that you have mentioned, uh, uh, Hideki Kamadi, who are driving the innovative technologies that you described uh, are private. In fact, until now, the nuclear industry has tended uh, to rely on government support. Do you think the paradigm is shifting here? Will we see private capital begin to play a more uh, important role? And uh, what could be done to boost that? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, we GIF is a kind of a, a national activity not a private one, so it is not uh, adequate for us to speak about the uh, activity of the private company, but uh, I have to say uh, that such uh, uh, innovative uh, development we need or uh, the uh, very speed up or in, of the innovation is very important uh, for the innovative activity. So the contribution of the private company uh, we think that these are very important. And uh, maybe it's uh, coming from the, also the U.S. He's, um, Rita San also said something there. Thank you. Yes, I, I do want to put the same question to you, Rita Baron. While you mentioned uh, the importance of public-private partnerships, how do you see the role of the private sector in bringing advances forward? So what we have seen is that very much so the private industry is driving uh, the innovation in this sector. Government is certainly um, willing to support and we continue to do that. But uh, as you mentioned, uh, there, there has been a, a paradigm shift. And what's, what's very serendipitous at the moment is that we do see a lot of interest from 
venture capitalists, from angel investors, from philanthropists investing in the nuclear energy sector. And we certainly need to continue to leverage that and take advantage of it because uh, the window of opportunity, as we've talked about in this session, um, is quite small. And so uh, we're very grateful for that interest uh, in private industry, and we need to continue to uh, run with it. Thanks very much. And I'll just look around the room one more time. Any other question here or from Jeff? OK, then I will say thank you to our speakers for those very interesting presentations and also the discussion. And that brings this part of session uh, one to an end. We are going to continue, though, after a break. This is our room disinfection break that we are required to take uh, for reasons of uh, health precautions. So I'm going to ask everybody to meet back here in exactly one hour. Also, please, to our online, online audience, don't go away. Just take Take a little break, and we'll see everybody back here to continue our discussion on the role of innovation in the nuclear sector in one hour's time. That'll be 3.30 Viennese time. And we'll go straight from that uh, uh, discussion into our final session of today. So don't want to miss that. Please come back. See you shortly. <laughs>